Uh, my name is Josh Hammond, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. This is my first time here at Catalyst, at least when there are people here. Um, that's not because I was here last Sunday. Um, no, seriously, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I have my wife and three kids, which could not be here this morning. We are uh, traveling to Tennessee uh, this afternoon to speak at another church this afternoon, so they are at home. We have, uh, together we have a two-year-old son. He's our oldest. We have a one-year-old son, and then we have a one-month-old daughter. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you for clapping, um, because it's been rough. Uh, if you look at me, I've, I've aged a few years in the last month. Uh, I haven't slept in about three years, two and a half, two and a half years. I'm originally from Evansville, Indiana. I was born and raised right here in Evansville. I've lived in every school district in Evansville. So I spent some time here. I have family at the bottom of Wrights Hill, and I have family in, in Howell. Um, so this is, kind of, this is kind of like home for me. When, when I was growing up, my mother was 15 years old when she was pregnant with me. I grew up not knowing my real father. When uh, my mother remarried to the man that was my stepfather, but the only man that I knew was dad, and he uh, was a drug dealer. Growing up in and out of my home all the time were drugs and all kinds of crazy things, and my mom had this idea, in order to expose me to something good, then uh, she would take me to church. So occasionally on, church, occasionally on Sunday, she would force me to go to church. And, and I tell people, maybe you've heard this before, but I grew up with a drug problem because occasionally on Sunday, my mom drugged me to church. Okay, maybe some of you on your way home, you'll get it then, and maybe it'll be funny then. Um, anyway, I hated church. I hated it with a passion. I was just a little kid, but I hated it. Uh, number one... Why do most churches meet at the crack of dawn? Um, anyway, there were songs that I didn't understand, words that were used that I didn't understand. People would come in dressed to the, dressed to the nine in their nice suits and ties with their industrial size Bibles and talking a good talk. I didn't get it. I hated it. And then the pastor would get up and ramble on for, for quite some time, and it was like Charlie Brown and his teachers. Do you, exactly. Hey, good. I'm, I'm glad that didn't go over some of your heads. If you didn't get that, ask someone that brought you later. Um, but I, I hated it. But the biggest reason that I hated church had nothing to do with the music, had nothing to do with people being dressed up, had nothing to do with what the pastor was talking about. The biggest reason that I hated church is because there was a whole group of people that went to church on Sundays and talked a good talk on Sundays, but throughout the rest of the week, most of them were at my house. And they weren't there to share Jesus with my family. I saw... I saw people that had a one day a week religion with God. It was stupid. I wanted nothing to do with it. I hated it. And I thought that I hated Christians. I thought all Christians go to church on Sundays and put on this mask of religion so that they can feel better than other people one day out of the week. I grew up like that. It wasn't until I was... 13 years old, which again, that's, yes, it's very young, 13 years old, I was signed up against my will by my mother, who was a crack addict and an alcoholic, to go to a place called Camp Reveal. I had been to this place before as a little kid, and I knew that they talk about Jesus, and I knew that this was a, one of those Christian things, but I also knew that they had a lake. I also knew that there were girls that were going to be there. 
But I, I thought about it. I didn't want to go. But I thought, you know, if my mom was sober long enough to sign me up for this thing, maybe I should go. And if I didn't like what they had to say, I'd come back and, and pick up where I left off. So I went. And I was, I was on the defensive. I was ready to show these Christians for what they really are and what they're really trying to do. And I found something I'd never found before, and I saw something that I'd never seen before. For the first time in my life, I didn't just see people talk about Jesus and then go and live like it was a lie. I saw people that took their vacation time to spend a week with kids that could give them nothing back. Kids that statistically would end up in prison, strung out on drugs, or dead. And they loved on us. But I didn't just see that, but I heard from their mouth the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God, that we are separated from God because of our sin, and that God does not want anyone to go to hell. That he sent Jesus, his son, to die on the cross in our place and to take our punishment. That message changed my life forever. I remember going back home, and I was weeping on the steps of my house. And my dad, my dad was a tough guy. At this time, my parents are divorced. My mom's running crazy. My dad worked in a factory in the daytime. And at night, he worked in a bar as a bouncer. And he was a bodybuilder. And, and I was weeping on the steps. And he said, what's wrong with you? Why are you crying? And I said, Dad... I just, found, I just found out that Jesus died for me and I gave my life to Christ and I know that if I died right now, I would go to heaven. And I know that you don't have Christ and I want you to know Christ like I know Jesus. And my dad was like, oh, oh don't worry, Josh. Uh, you know, you're young. This is a phase. I went through this phase too. In a, in a month, this will be over and you'll be back to your old self again. I was 13 when that happened. This has been a very long phase in my life. <laughs> um, but God started putting on my hearts that right then, when, when I first heard the gospel, I said, if this is real, if this is real, then, then this, isn't, this isn't the games that I saw before in church. That if this is real, this is worth every part of my life. That there is nothing more important than this. And that conviction, that conviction led me to study missions because I knew that not only do I want people here in Evansville to know Jesus and to be saved by the God who is pursuing them and has been pursuing them since the beginning of time, but I, I know that God has called every one of us to share the gospel around the world. Ten years ago, I was in a Bible study and somebody asked me, what are you going to do when I... When I graduate, I was two weeks from graduating university, which was a miracle too, by the way. Um, you can ask any of my professors. Um, but it, what, was, what they asked me, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I was thinking, I have no idea. But what came out of my mouth was, I'm going to China. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament about a guy named Balaam and his donkey. Uh, I like the King James version of that because I think it more, it describes my personality better. Uh, some of you have no idea what that means. I can tell by the blank look. If you can ever find a King James Bible, go look up the word donkey. You'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, again, maybe at lunch it'll hit you. <laughs> but what came out of my, my mouth was I'm, I'm going to China. And I was like, I have no desire to go to China. But I remembered when I was 13, if this is real, if this is true, then it is worth my life. And I knew that this was God speaking through me. I had no idea when or how I was going to end up going to China, but I knew one day I would somehow end up in China. Within a month, I got a phone call that said, hey, from a group a, a, a denomination, which I was not a part of any denomination. At the time, I hated denominations. 
But this, this group called me up and they said, Josh, uh, we've been praying about this opportunity. And your name kept coming up. And, um, you know, I didn't tell anybody else about going to China. I didn't tell anybody. And this group that I had little contact with and didn't say anything to about going to China called me up and said, there's an opportunity. We don't know why your name keeps coming up, but it's in China. We don't know if it's dangerous or safe, but here's the opportunity. Within uh, a month after that, I was on an airplane going to China. I could speak two words in Chinese, hello and thank you. Uh, it, just in case you're wondering, that doesn't get you very far. And, uh, and I didn't blend in too well in China either. Um, not everyone's as tall as Yao Ming, so even, even I stood up above everyone else. What was amazing in China is that I saw people who had been told their whole lives there is no God, that there is no hope outside of your government. And I saw people that were hungry and desperate for the gospel, that were hungry and desperate to know that not only was there a God, but God created them to love them. And that he sent his son to die on the cross so that they could have life. Not only so that they could be delivered and have freedom in this life, but that they could come back home to the Father. China's in what we call the 1040 window. Do you all know what the 1040 window is? It, uh, they don't sell them at Lowell's or Home Depot. The 1040 window, if you look at a globe, is 10 degrees above the equator to 40 degrees above the equator. It's a little window of the world. There are 3.3 billion people that live in this little window of the world. 90% have never heard the gospel. 90% have no idea that not only is there a God, but that Jesus made a way for us to be right with God. 90%. China is the largest nation in the 1040 window with 1.4 billion people. Billion people. And um, we have the privilege to begin to work and, and do evangelism and to do work with what's called the underground house church in China. In China, it is illegal for us to do what we're doing this morning. Uh, actually, I was in a meeting like this with about the same number of people five years ago this past um, June. And 120 Chinese police officers came in and surrounded us I was taken in for interrogation. I was kicked out of China and many of the brothers in that room, brothers and sisters, were arrested. I had spent years in China getting to spend time with, with Christians just like you or people just like you who had just been released from prison after being beaten every single day and being electrocuted every day because they refused to stop telling people about Jesus. And the first place they go when they're released is to gather with other Christians to see how they can share the gospel with more people. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew, or if you have an, an iPhone or an iPad or an iPod, uh, you can click to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at verse 24 on. While you're turning there, let me set up the scene. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's telling them that they're about to go into, into Jerusalem. And he's going to, he, he tells them that I'm going to be handed over to the authorities and, and they're going to kill me. Now, around the world, there are Christians who are giving their lives every single day to follow Christ because they believe it's worth their lives. In the passage that we're looking at, 
You have to understand what the disciples were thinking when, when Jesus says that he's going to be killed. They're going to go into Jerusalem. He's going to be killed. Up to this point, his disciples, they would walk into a town and everyone freaked out when Jesus was coming into town. Uh, thousands and thousands of people would flock to hear Jesus talk. Thousands of people would come and bring sick people so that he would heal them. And, and they enjoyed, everywhere they went, uh, his disciples were like on top of the world. They were, they, were, they were like movie stars. And then Jesus says, that's not what it's about. Listen to what's going to happen. I'm going to give my life. They're going to kill me. And Peter says, no, Lord, this can't happen to you. And then Jesus tells Peter, Peter, get, get behind me, Satan. You have in mind the thoughts of men, not the thoughts of God. You see, the disciples had a certain idea of what it meant to follow Jesus, of what it looked like to follow Jesus. They thought at that time it's going to be comfortable, that they're always going to have the favor of the crowd, that they're always going to get preferential treatment, that people are always going to come and, and applaud them, and it's, and it's going to be nice and, and, and cozy. But what Jesus says is, no, that's not what it's like to be my disciples. In 1624, look at what he says. He shatters their world with this. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will have it. And you all know the next phrase, for what will it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul. Now that's a long passage, but let's look at this the way, the way that the disciples would have understood this. This was a radical call that Jesus is giving them. He's telling them that no, it's not supposed to be comfortable. It's not all about all the junk that you can get. It's not all about living your life so that you can have all of the fame and all of the fortune and all of this stuff, that there is one thing that matters more than anything else, and it will cost you everything. Jesus' first words in English are so important, and they're only two letters long. If. He's saying what I'm about to tell you is not going to be easy. And I'm not forcing you into this. If anyone would come after me. He must deny himself. It's all of those, all of those things that we are holding on to in our lives, all of the things that we know are keeping us from living for the one thing that matters more than anything else, deny yourself. What Jesus says to them next gripped their hearts and filled them with fear. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross. To us today, that doesn't mean much. When we hear those words, it kind of rolls in one side and right out the other, but his disciples understood it this way. They walked down Roman roads. They walked past everyday murderers and rapists who were being brutally tortured to death. It was a tool of not just execution, a tool of embarrassment, a tool of death. And when Jesus says to them, take up your cross, I imagine their response was, <gasps> maybe for a moment they started to understand that this could cost them everything. But he didn't just say, hey, you're going to give up everything for me uh, and you're not going to have anything. What, he's, what he does is he puts it in perspective. He says, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. That means we're going to come to the end of our days, every single one of us. Here's a shocking statistic that I just learned. The human death rate right now hovers at 100%. <laughs> it's shocking. 
fresh, it's brand new statistic. Every single one of us is going to die. William Wallace says it this way, uh, everyone dies, but not everyone truly lives. Jesus is saying, you're going to die. You're going to come to the end of your days. You're going to stand before the God who, who spoke light into existence, the God who breathes galaxies. And what you do, all of the junk that you have worked for, all of the things that you have, that all of this stuff that the world has sold you that you need to get, that you need to continue to strive for, that you need to have this, that you need to do this, that you need to look like this, that you need to talk like this, all of these things, then it doesn't matter. It's wasted. It's gone. But then he says, whoever loses his life for my sake will have it. Did you all know that there are only two things that last for all eternity? Two things. The Bible tells us that it's God and the souls of people. And if our lives are not lived out for those two things, then we're wasting it. Is what you're living for, is it worth your life? I've had the, the privilege of, of meeting uh, brothers and sisters from the persecuted church. The underground house church in China, again, is under persecution. Uh, they, they're, they're a church that mostly dwells in poverty. Uh, I was telling your pastor this morning, as I look at your building, I've, I've been in villages where Christians have been meeting for 50 years in a one-room mud hut with a light bulb, so this is awesome. There right now, the persecuted church is sending missionaries from China into very dangerous places. This network that I worked with, they were sending missionaries into Afghanistan. Chinese missionaries from the underground house church into Afghanistan to share the gospel. And, and God was doing amazing things. There was a there was a family of missionaries. The husband's name is Joseph. The wife's name is Mary. Mary and Joseph. They had a son. You know what their son's name was? No, it wasn't Jesus. No, but, but normally in church, Jesus is the right answer. Uh, that time, no, his name is Elijah. Joseph and Mary, Elijah's four years old when they went into Afghanistan. Did you hear that? A husband and wife, four-year-old son, go into a place where sharing the gospel can and probably will get you killed? Joseph had baptized many, many uh, Afghans, all former Muslim, some of them even former Mujahideen, which are the holy warriors that fought against the Russians, and some of them even fought against the Americans. And they were being baptized in his house in a bathtub. Because if they go outside, people will kill them. And uh, after all these people that Joseph had baptized, one of them gave him a call one day. Uh, there was a false sister. And she said, Joseph, you're going to give me money. Because if you don't, I'm going to tell them that you're baptizing people and you know they'll kill you. Now imagine that. What if somebody told you this morning, if you go to church, you know they're going to kill you. Or if you talk to your neighbor and, sh and talk to them about Jesus, you know they're going to kill you. Or... If you, if you live out your Christian faith, you know they're going to kill you. Many of us, we don't even need a phone call like that. I'll never forget what Joseph said to her. He said, you go ahead and call because I came to Afghanistan to die to share the gospel with the Afghan people. Did you hear what he said? I came to die 
to share the gospel with the Afghan people. Joseph was convinced that this was worth his life. I'll never forget what he said to her next either. He said, but let me warn you, before they kill me, I'm going to tell them it was you I baptized. <laughs> she didn't call back after that. <laughs> Are you living? Are you living your life for something that's worth your life? Is your walk with Jesus something that you just come in here and do on Sundays? Or are you putting your life on the line to follow him? Billions of people in our world today are waiting to hear the gospel. Billions of people outside these walls are lost and dying and going to hell and have no idea that Jesus died on the cross, that there is a God who created the world, who has been pursuing them from the foundations of the earth through generations and generations, and he has called his church to go and take the gospel and bring them back home. Are you living your life for the thing that matters more than anything else? My wife and I and my three kids were, were moving in January. We've been, we've been in China. When we were arrested in China, uh, we were kicked out of China. And uh, then we went to do church planting in Hong Kong. And uh, we've been working with a church in Hong Kong for the last four years. And now we're back here until January. And in January, we moved to go to the Philippines. In the southern island of Mindanao in the Philippines, which has been called the Afghanistan of Southeast Asia. Because there are Muslim, uh, uh, extreme Muslim groups that are operating there. Uh, Abu Sayyaf, Jamaa Islamiyah, whose uh, goal and aim is to uh, kill missionaries, kidnap missionaries, uh, convert or kill Christians, and to, to uh, spread Sharia law all throughout Mindanao. There was a a brother that I had met from the Philippines who's a pastor and he said God has called me to take the gospel to Pakistan his name is Pastor Danny this month he leaves for Pakistan to share the gospel with Pakistanis this brother knows it could cost his life but he also knows that it is worth his life so that others can hear the gospel if this is true, if this is real, it is worth our lives. It's worth walking across the street to share the gospel with our neighbors. It's worth going around the world so that others can hear the gospel. Is your life lived out for the one thing that matters more than anything else? Some of you in here are thinking, I don't, know about, I don't know about all this stuff. Maybe you've heard me talk about how it's worth our lives as, as Christians, those who follow Jesus, to give up our lives so that others can hear the gospel so that we can bring the lost home. Maybe you're in here today and you think, that's me. Don't go another day without giving your life to Christ. Some of you in here are Christians and you have you've squandered your time. This city needs you. Your neighborhood needs you. Your work needs you. Your school needs you. The nations need you. Act now. Stop being lazy. Do you believe it? Is it real? If it's real, it's worth your life. Every single day, 50,000 people who have never heard the name of Jesus are dying. And we have the only answer. God has called us 
to not only share the gospel in their neighborhoods, but around the world. Uh, later, pastor's going to share with you a way that you can help share the gospel around the world. Can I pray for us? Can I pray for, for you? And Will you pray for us as we go in, in January? I'm not saying something here that is not lived out in my life. Um, we have very angry family members right now who are saying, why are you going? Why are you going there? You're going to die. You're taking your kids. What are you thinking? Bring my grandbabies home. We're convinced that this is worth our lives. Because if Jesus be God and he gave his life for us, what a small thing that we could give our lives for the one thing that matters for all eternity. There's a missionary that was martyred in Ecuador and he said this, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, I thank you so much for brothers and sisters like this. I thank you. We know that in this room, there are people in all different um, areas of their walk in their lives. I know that there are people in this room who don't yet know who you are. People who um, know who you are but are still trying to discover what you've called us to be as believers. And God, I thank you for the brothers and sisters in here who are pursuing you and seeking you to make you known in this neighborhood and around the nations. God, I pray that we would know your truth, that you would set us free. I pray for those who don't know you or those who aren't following after you. God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray that you would be glorified in their lives, that you would rescue them, and as a loving father, you would welcome them home. Father, as a church, may we not squander our time. May we live for the thing that matters more than anything else. Amen.